this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows every week, on Thursdays, we release a bonus show to members only on the website. Website. So if you want to hear more of the show on a weekly basis, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button and become a member today. And with the emergencies going on in the world, you see Texas and what happened a couple of weeks ago down in Texas, it is never wrong to be prepared. So if you want to prepare you and your family for that emergency in your life, go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's prepare with the confessionals.com and there you can get yourself emergency supplies emergency food that will last up to 25 years on the shelf so if you want to get yourself some of that stuff go to prepare with the confessionals.com now today we have matt coming on the show and matt contacted me and he and his family have a very unique situation where they were victims of the whole satanic panic era going on back in the late 80s early 90s where his dad was actually convicted of being a satanic cult leader put in jail wrongfully accused and one thing that really frustrated me after I did this interview is that I realized that I forgot to talk about his brother John and how John played a role in getting his dad convicted underneath the facade of manipulation by those in control. What happened is John actually testified against his dad, which was a big piece of evidence towards putting his dad in jail. And now John is actually working with his family to exonerate his dad. This was a very interesting conversation I had with Matt. We talk about how his mom had a role in it and how his mom might have been abused and maybe possibly involved in the MK Ultra side of things. We get into it on this interview and also on the overtime segment of this show. This is a two-part show. The overtime segment, we get into a deeper conversation about the MK Ultra stuff, plus Matt and his family's paranormal experiences. I really hope you guys enjoy this conversation and the overtime segment there for members. Let's get to Matt right now. Time trailer. He uh, I turned onto the road, um, which led up to my customer's house, and I was maybe a quarter mile from my last turn, I believe. And I got a phone call, and it was one of the supply companies. It might have been like a Home Depot, just confirming like an order. So it was kind of an inconsequential, just like seven or eight second literal phone calls. Like, okay, cool, I'll be there, so and so. Uh, maybe a 10, 15 second phone call, but 
I um, had my GPS on because going all between the places, it definitely helped to have a, a guiding map uh, handy, even though I pretty much knew the area, but um, some parts were kind of new to me. And um, I looked at my phone, which was on my little dash holder for it, and I clicked the red button to end the call. And as soon as I looked up, the whole scenery, and you, you got to think for me to look down at my phone pushing up. Um, I mean, I've still got the road in my peripheral, but somewhere in my crossing and looking up, the whole view around me was completely different, was completely changed. And, um, and I, I was very disoriented, like, um, that, you know, this doesn't seem right. How did I get on this wrong road? And I drive maybe a quarter mile. I'm like, okay, I would have seen the customer's house. And um, and I uh, pull over because my maps was frozen up. And my maps was frozen on the spot. And I looked back at it and I was able to zoom in. And it showed me where I thought I was at right before my customer's turn. But I knew that this area was not right, but the maps was frozen. I had to restart my phone, turn the you know phone back on. It updated, and also in that time there was there's no passive time. You know, it's like a few second phone call, and I literally looked down for two seconds and was in a completely different area. The um, and just to confirm, when my phone came back on, I looked back at the um, the phone call and the time that it took place. And at this point, um, you know, I'd already pulled, drove, drove some, pulled over, gone through, staring at my map deal, and then my it being frozen, um, turning my phone back off, turning it back on. So it'd been like five or six minutes since that phone call. My map's updated, and it showed me like nine miles away from that location, but it was on a completely different road too. All right, today we got Matt on the show. Matt, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good, Tony. I appreciate you letting me come on. Absolutely, man. So, uh, Matt, you contacted the show, and I'm really glad that you did because you have a very unique family history, and uh, it, it's it's really cool for me as a podcaster to have the opportunity to talk to somebody like you. Uh, because some of the things that we talk about on the show, you have actually lived through in a very public light. Now, I know you're the youngest of four kids. And when all this happened, you were just literally a baby. But growing up in the family, you heard about it, you saw the uh, effects that it took on your other siblings, and obviously your parents. And so, Matt, I, I'm just going to let the, the audience know right here that uh, the family's original last name was Quinny and since then has been changed. And that's, uh, well, you're going to find out why. But Matt's dad was accused of being a satanic cult leader back in the late 80s and was actually arrested and jailed for it wrongfully. And since then, more information has come out and new uh, witnesses, if you want to call it that, came forward to redact their statements. And it's a very interesting path that your family has been on since the late 80s, and it continues through this day. So, uh, Matt, I want to hand it over to you and let you kind of tell this story as to how this all started and where it took you and your family. Okay. Well, I'm going to kind of jump around the timeline a little bit, if that's okay. It might make a little bit more sense of it because really a lot of my family history um, and what I thought I knew of it versus what really happened has kind of evolved and changed over the years as, you know, you find out more truth and you know, hear the other sides of the story, put the puzzle pieces together, if that makes sense. Um, so I would say maybe 12, 13 years old. I remember asking my older siblings a little bit more about my uh, dad. And uh, this was just a few years after my mom had passed. So at this point, uh, let's see, my mom died when I was nine. So just a few years before that. Um, so 
I was living away from my older siblings at this time with a foster family that had previously kept them like in the early 90s when we were f- first going through um, all the stuff with my dad and the trial. And of course, you know, that part I don't really remember, but I've learned a lot about since. So, you know, I start hearing stories and um, of him being a satanic occult leader, because at that point we still all believed that and, uh, started, uh, kind of putting the pieces together to some of the paranormal or, uh, maybe demonic experiences we had growing up and thought that it all stemmed from the fact that my dad was this occult leader. And um, even had uh, some experiences after that, which, you know, I may tap into later uh, when we have more time to talk about the paranormal stuff um, that kind of stemmed out of that, um, that knowledge and finding and, um, and kind of finding out, you know, all the dark secrets of our past and, and, um, thinking that there was, you know, some dark destiny for us or that that was what was, you know, my mom was trying to protect us from or so she thought, you know, and, um, anyway, so, you know, I get through high school and everything and, uh, young adult life. I was married and, uh, just, uh, been on Facebook only for maybe a, a couple of years at this point. And I started getting curious. So I, um, searched for my dad's name and, uh, and I found what I thought was him and I kind of looked it over and I was like, okay, that resemblance is uncanny. So I figured, okay, that's got to be him. So I, I sent him a message kind of um, hesitantly, I guess you would say, um, just because I was still in the thought process at the age of, I think I was 22. Um, so this would have been maybe nine years ago. Um maybe eight years ago. And uh, I sent him a message because now it's just kind of curious. And when I asked him some questions about the past and some of that stuff, he sent me, um, sent me a really long message back. I still can't remember what I was said, but um, you know what he sent me back just gave me the impression. This man didn't sound like anything like what I expected or, and um, I finally fessed to my uh, brother and sister that I'd reached out to him and had received a letter and then kind of shared that. And they uh, started kind of asking themselves questions, too, and started kind of doubting maybe some of the stuff they believed about the occult stories and um, some of the abuses that they had supposedly undergone, um, like ritual type abuses, if that makes sense. Um so they, um, you know, my brother began to kind of rehash a lot of that and kind of question. And my sister started to do the same. And I think my sister finally reached out. And and all in all, maybe two years after the, the first time I reached out to him, we finally decided to get together and drive down and go meet him. And so uh, I think it was my... Uh, older brother and sister that came along and uh so, so it was the three of us i don't think tammy was involved with that first meeting and um and when first met him um you know the first impression was just uh it was like i was sad you know sad for him because i really felt then and there and and maybe you can kind of get the impression or an energy off of somebody. And if there's something so bad, like I would have sensed it, I think. And, um, I remember hugging him for the first time and, uh, it is just like a whole load kind of washed away, but there's a huge question mark. Okay. What happened? You know, what, what's going on? Uh, because uh, it didn't take long meeting with him, talking to him, and then, you know, meeting with our uncle, um, his brother, and meeting some of the other family that weekend uh, to realize that 
you know, nobody else in the family believed what we believed or thought these things. And they all knew that it was crazy that he was being tried for him. And what he finally got charged with was like indecency or something with the minor. Um, but basically at that time, um, if I backtrack kind of the story, um, and to what had actually happened transpired is through the course of, uh, him and my mother's divorce, my mom had come forward and told him that she was um, going to be fighting for custody, that they, he was not going to get to see the kids anymore. And, um, you know, he asked why. And she says, well, because uh, Sarah's been molested. Okay. And um, he, he knew right then at that point, um, well, he he asked, well, who, who done it? And, or, you know, who are they investigating? And mom said, just you. And then she left and, you know, he calls the caseworker or CPS and, and realizes that he's, you know, having fingers pointed at him. Well, then the story transpired within, you know, days and weeks and grew bigger, you know, all the way to the point where there was, um, you know, all this satanic occult stuff happening and just crazy, crazy stories to go along with it. And, you know, my older siblings, I would have gone to foster care at that point, um, probably six, seven weeks old. And that's, I think some of those events is what triggered me to start remember, maybe remembering stuff really early because I can remember being held by my foster mom at that point. I can remember crawling around. Um, I can remember uh, gnawing on a... <laughs> some uh, cut up pieces of peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, you know, it's, and I think some of that maybe just had to do with separation and trauma, you know, um, at that time. But meanwhile, I'm in that, that, that foster care program and, uh, my brother and sister, I think, uh, for a time, maybe we're in a state facility and they were undergoing, um, basically a lot of therapy and interviews with police and, and therapists and experts and um, and apparently were immediately put on medications along the pro along the way and um, they seem you know would recall that they were really confused at the time as to what was going on or um, why they were even there and then they had to learn the story somehow and so really through just manipulation and. And through stories, my mom, who was schizophrenic at the time, and it blows my mind that, you know, the law wouldn't have taken that into consideration. Um, like, hey, is this a feasible evidence? And apparently, I guess there's a case in uh, California as well where the person that was making the accusation also had paranoid schizophrenic tendencies as well. And um, the fact that, you know, that kind of witness account or the what he called mental illness wasn't taken in as, Hey, here's a factor we need to consider and see if this is plausible. And so, um, you know, I, I guess it made news headlines and, um, you know, and so people in the area even started thinking, cause it's a great big news story. Oh, satanic a cult leader, you know, uh, having murdered and, and mess with his kids, you know, is really juicy stuff, I guess, to Bill throw out there and, so, it, you know, it took off. And finally, after it all, um, it, um, I guess once all transpired, he got sentenced, I want to say to 20 years. And I think he served half of them and got out. Um, I may have to double check my facts. So I'm sorry if I'm wrong on the numbers to be exact, but, uh, um, I guess uh, we had, we'd gone on and moved on and um, within a couple of years, my mom had gotten our names changed and um, was paranoid that there are people from the occult after us so we were moving a lot. I would say by the time I was six, we'd moved probably 15, 20 times. Um, in fact, um, and some of the stuff my mom claimed was stuff revolving around her being a subject of MK Ultra, and um, 
And I, I can't validate or say what's true or not from her because her whole past is kind of riddled with lots, a lot more questions and mystery than, hey, is there? So I, I do take kind of what she says with a grain of salt, but the the um, story and conspiracy behind it is a little bit bizarre. Um, so, you know, she has kind of this bizarre backstory that seems to follow up to all of this. Um, actually happening and her leading out on, you know, pointing her finger at my dad and accusing him of uh, Satan worship and occult practices. Um, So there were some events that happened, I would say, in my early life uh, growing up that very much resembled or seemed to relate back to that kind of subject manner. And, um, it would include like spiritual warfare type things, witnessing a demonic uh, possession. And, um, even one where I believe, and if it's an okay time, I can maybe even expound at least on these two stories. Yeah, go for it. Um, the uh i'm going to start with the uh i guess the one that revolves more around like some of the mk ultra matter but i remember at the time um i was 5 and we lived in the houston area we had a friend from church and uh his name was denny i won't say any last names but if he's hearing this he might know <laughs> um a shame on him <laughs> but uh denny was a friend of ours from the church and I want to say he was like one of those one of those kind of almost cult Christian type sex where it's like okay well God can only be called this name or that name or he can only be called Yeshua and a lot of times you see some really weird or radical ideas <laughs> or things on some of those extreme you know, labeled as Christian, but really, I think as a believer, I recognize a lot of these things as more of a type of a cult, if that makes sense. Um, but anyways, he he had a son my age, and um, we'd play together. Uh, he'd fix some things around the house sometimes, and we, we just rented. Um, but I remember staying over at his house a couple of times and the very last time I ever stayed over there, uh, Denny approached me and his son. We'd been playing pretty hard. It's probably three or four in the afternoon. I'm pretty sure my parents are coming to, or my mom and my aunt, um, uh, which isn't no relation to my mom. It's just a really awesome friend that became best friends with my mom and has been family ever since. Um, so she's still our aunt today. So she's kind of lived a lot of the nightmare with us or at least the aftermath. And for whatever reason, I'd say as a godsend that she stuck through it all and stuck with us. Um, because I think just saw anybody else would have given up and like, Hey, I'm done. This is enough crazy. I'm, <laughs> I don't need this family that bad, you know, but she really stepped up to the plate and, uh, made a lot of things possible for us and made it possible for us to stay together as long as we did. So, um, I would definitely give a shout out to my aunt Weezer if she ever hears this. Um, but so she, she and my mom were going to come and pick me up, uh, from my friend, um, uh, Denny's son. And, um, so we were a few hours from that and he, uh, he comes to us and he says, Hey, um, you want a piece of bubble gum? Yeah, sure. So I remember he takes a piece of gum and he tears it in half and gives one piece to his son, gives one piece to me. He says, all right, well, y'all come sit down and watch a puppet show. So we go sit down and, uh, Austin had like a little puppet stand thing. And I didn't think anything of it, but then my first impression was, oh, I'm kind of dizzy, kind of tired. And then the puppet show started. And at first it seemed like there was maybe two puppets talking, but then, um, yeah, five years old, I witnessed like the faces start changing on the puppets and my vision seemed very distorted. And then, um, 
I start hearing multiple voices coming from the puppets and what sounds like um, languages that I couldn't really even understand. Um, and so um, what I kind of gathered from that experience and then find what I found out later on, which I'll share here in a second, reaffirmed my suspicion looking back and this was a realization I had, um, I'd say in my later teen years, um, Denny had done something, I believe in the line of either programming or mind deprogramming. And I believe what was on that gum was LSD or something that might be used in, you know, that kind of psychoactive effect. Um, because, I, it seems like I passed out um, maybe just minutes after watching and experiencing all of that. And I don't remember being able to really do anything about it or being able to move. And then I remember waking up and I didn't remember anything about it for a good while. Um, but then it seems like maybe later in the week, I recalled something about the story to my mom and then the puppets changing face. And then next thing I was hearing, I was kind of confused about because I still hadn't realized that Denny was a bad guy. Um, they caught on. My mom said that she sensed that Denny was a really bad man. Well, I look up Denny and on his LinkedIn profile, he is listed as a spiritual healer and um, and a mental programmer slash deprogrammer. Wow. I was, oh, okay. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> so when that came to, to fruition, just finding that out, it's like, okay. All right. Well, and a lot of it, what kind of made me go back and even rehash it was some of the stories I heard here on the show, Tony, you know, uh, kind of gave me inspiration or helped me recall a certain memory or something maybe I hadn't thought about in a decade. <laughs> you know, I mean, life goes on. I'm married with kids now, and there's plenty of other things that I might buy my time and space. So um, trying to recall all of this now is is a little bit of a feat for me trying to, to talk about it all. So I'll try to tell a story best I can where it can make some sense. Um Shortly thereafter, maybe around the same time, my mom also, um, she was a believer, Christian, and she claimed to be, you know, have recovered and been victim of the occult. But through all these years, like she held on to that as a real memory, like she really remembered doing that, even though at least as far as my dad's concerned, there was no relation of anything like that possibly happening but maybe there is something from her past. And then I also question, well, if there is nothing from the past, how do we get entangled with this weird guy, Denny, that's into programming and deprogramming and giving little kids LSD? <laughs> you know, like how, how, why would that come up or how would that transpire? Um, and it seemed like my mom, my mom and my aunt would claim about, like astral projection type stuff, people standing in the living room or there being like noises, um, like astral projected into the house or like just their room sometimes. And sometimes it could be like an alarm sound or it could be it's just some really, really bizarre stuff that's out there, you know? And so, um, let's see, we, we took care of this girl that came and stayed with us. She was a little older than all of us and she was maybe, Oh, she was probably 16 or 17 at this time. And she was um, borderline mentally retarded, but she had been having issues with, um, with d demonic oppression and her parents were believers were really awesome people. Um, they, um, but they, they looked to my mom as somebody that had experience that could help. That was a prayer warrior. You see through all the craziness and the lies, or maybe she believed the lies that she told, you know, maybe there's a part of her mind that told her that all this stuff that happened was with my dad or, you know, but she was, she was a prayer warrior. She would plead the blood of Jesus and it, it would seem to work, but sometimes it would seem to not. And, um, there always seemed to be some element of like spiritual warfare around the house. 
Um, and a few times I sensed or saw it, you know, but this girl, um, Lorraine became what I believe was possessed. And I remember us being out in the garage and my mom and aunt praying over her and her eyes just being, you know, pupils completely dilated. But I remember the essence of the room just feeling like there's a black cloud all in and around the room, like there's a weight and like you could feel a heat coming off from her from that, that, you know, and it was like just pure hatred. And as if you could feel it, like when you open an oven, you know, the heat, the heat blast, you know, you could feel that like a energetic wave of heat just coming from her. And so, you know, I witnessed that and, um, at the age of six, you know, so that's kind of early on. And then, um, let's see a little, a little later on, probably just some months down the road. This was after Lorraine. I think I might've been almost seven, maybe still six years old. My brother, you know, he was almost 10 years older, let's see, nine years older than me. Um, and so, you know, he'd, he'd get stuck babysitting sometimes and we'd spend a lot of time together. We were actually pretty, really good friends growing up, always been close and never been the, the fighting with each other type. But this one instance, um, he stepped on like a clay, uh, frog piggy bank of mine by accident that was under our water clothes. And at the time he was a hefty teenager. So, you know, maybe 250 pounds at the age of 15. And, um, and he told me about it and I remember just feeling this rage completely overtake me, but I just felt hot all at once. And I felt like whatever movements and moves I took, I had no control to stop what my body was doing. And, um, I could just feel like this heat burning, like as if I had a high fever or something, like it's just burning out of me kind of. And, uh, and I was probably 10 feet away from him. And I remember just lunging at him and I hit him so hard that he basically flew back into the wall, you know, th threw him back a couple of feet and then pounced him and proceeded apparently try to choke him. And then I remember hearing, um, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, um, I command you to leave. I plead the blood of Jesus over Matthew Kyle in the name of Jesus. I, and I remember just like becoming completely infuriated with that, except it, it wasn't really felt like me, if that makes sense. Like I had no control of the situation whatsoever. And then I remember what felt like just a lump in my stomach, like a big rock sitting in my stomach, like felt like I just moved up. And then I remember just throwing up everywhere. And whatever it was, was like relieved was gone. And, um, and to the best of my knowledge, you know, to get that kind of strength and, <laughs> and overwhelming fury all at once, because even at that age, a lot of times, most of the time I'd been pretty easy gone and I might've been sad, but in almost no cases, whatever gotten so mad to lash out at him, you know, it just wasn't normal in any way for me. <laughs> So, um, I remember the feeling of it. It's something that you don't forget. Um, and I would say it was just about as every bit intense as a couple of times I've really gotten to feel the Holy Spirit, but like total opposite, you know, does that make sense? You no, know, it makes, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, that's kind of like what we hear sometimes where people react to these kind of situations. Uh, and I know you're saying, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming is what you're saying is that you felt like, I mean, hindsight, you hindsight, you feel like you were possessed, right? Well, at, at the time, as best as I could understood it, I knew then because of being somewhat aware of the fact, having seen something similar before, but I kind of feel like, you know, some of the stuff that was maybe invited or around the house for whatever reason was able to do what it did that morning, not for long, but what it was definitely something else because I could not stop whatever was happening. There's no power left. To, it was like watching a video out of my eyes, if that makes sense, but not even hardly my own vision. Um, 
I, I don't know. But e- even then, I, I, you know, I think I understood um, just shortly after, you know, there's a lot of exposure to certain things at an early age where sometimes, you know, maybe I didn't have anything but time to think about. And um, I, I was a smart enough kid, you know, um, I actually graduated valedictorian, started when I got into school studies, started picking up real fast. And, um, you know, from an early age, was able to teach myself just about anything I wanted to. Um, so, you know, even at the age of five, I would jump on a piano. And the first time I ever got on one, I played Joy to the World. Sounded out wow. perfectly by like the third try, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. And then, so a lot of things, you know, I got blessed would, would come naturally. So even then, I think for six years old, I had maybe a little bit more of an acute understanding or at least exposure to things that no, hardly any six year olds would really, does that make sense? So, yeah. um, I, I had the logical sense to be able to put the two together and, and make some sense of what had happened. I didn't know how or why, <laughs> you know, it was just so out of the blue and hit so fast and so hard that uh, it's just something I'll never forget. But, you know, having felt some presences since then, um, I- I'm very aware of the fact or that I do believe it was a demonic type presence, you know, as opposed to, you know, some other spirit or ghost type thing, if that makes sense. Um, also, around that same time, I remember one night laying in bed, and this was about the time the insomnia started. I'd been on medications for about two years now, and looking back in hindsight, I kind of see certain things I dealt with as a kid, and I've been able to relate a lot of it back to the medications they put me on. And so, you know, some of the stuff that we'll be pursuing will be, you know, the fact that the medications have uh, done a number on our family and just um, so, you know, legally, we're actually going to be pursuing quite a bit in that field as well. Um, But um, anyways, the insomnia had kind of started and I remember laying there one night and um, I hear it's all quiet. And then I start hearing what sounds kind of like the symphony, but I can't quite locate it. But then I remember the sound being almost influential as if it was, could impress some kind of emotion on me of like peace and warmth. Does that make sense? And, um, the sound became greater and the sound is, it was something as such that, uh, mentally, I I can't recreate the sound in my memory because it's almost too beautiful to comprehend. Does that make sense? So it's just uh, kind of beyond description. And it was almost like I could hear it out there, but I could hear it inside from me at the same time. Like as if it was being projected from my own head and like I was hearing it in more ways than one. And so it, it already kind of struck me. I didn't know for sure, but then something just gave me the feeling that I was listening to angels and I was completely at peace. And the, it was voices, you know, like choirs of voices. But uh, the, I believe the following morning, my aunt had come in and she had been woken up she th- she told me later she'd been woken by an angel that told her that she needed to check on me now. And I didn't know, but I was sick and I, I had no idea. And it got really bad overnight while I was sleeping. And for some reason I was extremely dehydrated on top of it. And, um, it was sick enough that I couldn't get up and walk when she woke me up. So I got carried to the car and rushed to the ER. But, um, You know, um, I remember IVs and taking the needles all brave and being in the hospital for a couple of days after. But it's just really kind of interesting to me to be able to look back on the 
you know, the fact that, you know, I got to witness and hear and go to sleep to the voices of what I think were angels. And then, you know, being saved by a message from one, you know, the next morning. So I thought that was kind of cool (laughs) correlation. Uh, Maybe, maybe God knew or something, you know, maybe, maybe there was something happening to me and something happening around me. You know, we don't, we we live in this realm, but we, we kind of forget there's these spiritual battles going all around us. And sometimes I kind of wonder if some of those spiritual battles aren't also being fought on partially behalf of our physical well-being or, you know, stuff that can transcend to our physical well-being. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I thought that was real interesting. <laughs> Moving up, um, I, I guess I'm just going to follow a chronological order. I don't know if I yeah, have any more questions about my family specifically, if I've covered them up there. Well, let's, um, let's unpack the family stuff here, uh, because I, I think it's important to kind of explore this uh, right now. Okay. Um, so in the late eight, late 80s, this happens to your family mm-hmm. where... Uh, your mom wants a divorce and your dad, uh, uh, from what I understand, has not was not living with the family then uh, when she then told your dad that he can't see the kids anymore uh, because uh, mm-hmm. of of uh, sexual assault on your sister. And that was kind of like news to him. And he he didn't even really understand that he was the one being accused of it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's his first impression. He didn't even realize. So he calls CPS to see who's who's being investigated. And the caseworker says, hey, j- just you. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I want to tell the audience right now, because I forgot to mention in the beginning, um, there has mm-hmm. there was a, an entire season done uh, talking about your family and other families who have been uh, have fell victim to the the satanic panic of those days. And uh, if people want to check it out, it's called Gimlet. Uh, that's the company, Gimlet. Uh, but the the podcast itself is called Conviction. Uh, and then I guess the season's called American Panic, right? Conviction, American Panic. Yep. Yeah, and and I can't remember which bought which, but Gimlet. I think Spotify bought Gimlet. And so you can actually go and listen to it on Spotify free and easy. That's been the easiest way for me to access it. Right. So it, it may be on other platforms. I'm just not aware if it's anywhere else yet, but I, I want to say it may be exclusive to Spotify and Gimlet. Okay. So uh, I, 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 now that I got that out of the way, so maybe the audience will understand that I have some information already that maybe you didn't mention yet. So they're, they, cause they're probably no, thinking, no, I certainly appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. Cause, cause they're probably thinking, well, how, how does he know that? Because <laughs> Matt hasn't said that. <laughs> uh, but so that happens and that kind of throws the whole family into a whirlwind. And your mom, you mentioned about how she had her own issues. Now, do you mm-hmm. think that your mom's issues that she had, uh, it, I, this might be a, a dumb question, but I'll ask anyways, do you think she came into the marriage with those issues uh, as far as like the... I, the... Y- yes, I I do. And that's where some of the mystery shrouds, um, because, you know, dad didn't talk a whole lot. Um there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of talk or recollection of those kinds of things prior to this. Um, but then again, some of the family mystery is a little shrouded just because of, um, you know, her birth record being, uh, covered up and hard to find. And the only record I can find of, of her birth shows a different birth date than, what went in her uh, eulogy and, you know, on her record um, and shows that she was maybe born in New York. Um, But then there's an adoption record that took place just, uh, I want to say a couple of weeks after the Kennedy assassination. And so, you know, having that kind of weird idea there, we know that there was political ties, you know, from her adopted parents with the uh, Lyndon B. Johnson family. Um, so, 
it's it's hard to say. You know, she claims certain things that um, have also been recited by a handful of other people. And like one of the names I think that's out there in a lot of this conspiracy stuff might be like Kathy O'Brien. Um, you know, there is deals with my mom, um, supposedly suffering like multiple personality disorders. Um, but then it seems like a lot of these disorders kind of revolve back a lot of times to like a stem root of some kind of programming or MK ultra or some kind of weird government type abuse background. Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I wish wish she was alive and I could ask her more questions about this. But then again, I don't know what it'd be like if she was alive. Honestly, we may have never contacted my dad and we may have not been able to move on from that part of our lives, you know. So I I don't know. Um, so you her, mentioned, uh, you, mentioned you mentioned Kathy O'Brien. And if I remember correctly, uh, and maybe you know this, I. I but wasn't she the person who was claiming that she was some kind of like sex slave to, uh, I don't even know if I could say her name. The without Clinton. Getting... Yeah. <laughs> um, ah, you might have to, uh, okay. no, I'm just going to let it Hold go. Just pretend it's some other. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I was just making sure I was tracking with you on that. Uh, and, and I bring all this up because do you, I mean, you've had a lot of time to think about this stuff, but do you think that uh -huh. what your mom the ball your mom started rolling in your own family and putting your family through all the stuff you guys been through over the years, your dad specifically, uh, and obviously you guys as the uh -huh. kids being the byproduct of the whole thing. Do you think it might stem from something that might be a little bit more on the realistic side of like MK Ultra programming? I mean, uh, from what you're saying and things, I, there's there's a lot there's a lot of people out there that have these kind of experiences and maybe. Uh -huh. those experiences spawned what the real hell you guys went through that wasn't true but if she's suffering mental disorders and she, because of what she went through she just brought that into the marriage right. and into the family yeah you know she did have some there, I do have a little bit of insight as to what she claims to have gone through um, via a handwritten diary from Mm, I would say she was a teenager, so it was like maybe the 60s, 70s, and um, I think I think the story was for of her teenage days, but I think it may have been written later on. I don't remember the date that it was written on, but the stories included really, um, really graphic stuff, like supposedly, you know, like you know, being locked inside for days on end and being forced to do this or that. And then having certain parts of her body sewed up while she was awake and undergoing, um, um, some kind of ritual on the genitalia or some satanic type purpose. And, and it struck a chord that I found some, you know, similar transcript in some of the, I think, Kathy O'Brien stuff. But um, it seemed like there might have been some mention of something like a signature bird or something that was involved with the military program of MKUltra or Richard the Richard uh, psychological warfare program. Oh, are you talking about Robert um, Bird? But, huh? Are you talking about Robert Bird? the senator from Virginia? I think so. I think he was from Virginia and he died, uh, I think, in the mid-2000s. Okay. So, like, I hear what you're saying and I imagine for you and your family, it's it's got to be really hard to kind of go through this information and try to understand mm -hmm. what could be real, what could be not real, what could be the mm, symptom right. of somebody who just isn't mentally stable. And at the same time, like... It, well, is she not mentally stable because she actually went through this stuff? Because you know that what your family went through isn't true. And then you try to backtrack to her own personal life before the family even existed. And you start thinking, well, is that true? And that's why she she uh, mirrored mm -hmm. what she went through onto our family. 
Right. Well, you know, there were some real instances and there are some real things. Another thing that was kind of weird, it seemed like she was always in a cast or dealing with having a broken bone or something. Um, um, and then toward the end, she started getting real sick and she had like seven or eight major strokes, was paralyzed in three quarters of her body. Um, and uh, she could still talk and was sharp, you know, till the day she died. And then it was just a bad practice from the doctor. Um, infiltrating a main artery with an injection, an experimental type deal where, yeah, I guess he was supposed to be watching a monitor and he felt like he was better than the equipment he had to use and took a guess and, uh, you know, killed her. So um, I would say, you know, but her mind was always pretty much there. And my brother even says that like toward the end, she kind of stopped talking about some of that stuff and started talking about some of the good memories and good stuff and kind of acted like as if some of that was behind her. Um, I, you know, we, we were always churchgoers, though, and in the middle of all of that, we were always very faith-oriented, and Mom kept, a, you know, a Bible there on the... I mean, through all the craziness, it was the big leaning on thing, which I still hold to my faith, but for other reasons and other things that, you know, affirmed it in my past than maybe necessarily what I was just taught at that time, because I see a lot of hoax and question around what some, what I thought was our faith versus that question that this is real or true. or What was what, you know? Yeah. Uh, this doctor that uh, essentially killed your mom, is this a doctor that's, you know, still practicing today is i mean do you know anything about this person uh, honestly other uh, you know because at the age of nine i really didn't know much details and it was kind of later on that i found out you know what happened really happened you know and um you know that that evening our friend an older friend who's since since passed on and our aunt walked in the door and they were with her when she went and it's like, hey, sorry guys, mom's mom's not coming home. She she's gone on to home forever. It's like, oh shoot, you know. Yeah. So you know, just the shock of it, it's already something for a kid kind of get through without knowing all the details. And then, kind of months down the road, you know, I start hearing some talk of you know a lawsuit, and, and we had a little bit of a trust fund from all that stuff for a little while. But all in all, I want to say is maybe like $300,000 that was paid out to all of us, you know. So split up, once you pay for private school education and a little bit of life, that's gone, you know. But um, we, uh, you know, as far as the whereabouts of that doctor, I don't know. And honestly, his name, I, I can't recall at this point, just because some of those facts I haven't tried to hold on to, if that yeah. makes sense. No, it absolutely makes sense. And uh, I, the reason why I'm asking certain questions is I'm trying to understand and try to wrap my mind around just a lot of this stuff right now. Um, and, and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know where you stand on the idea idea of MK Ultra, um, but MK Ultra is not uh, something that's hypothetical. It's not something that is uh, just some kind of Reddit conspiracy. This is something that actually happened. Right. To the point that you mentioned the Clintons before, like President Bill Clinton actually issued a statement of a public apology for that program being run within our government. And so it's not a theoretical thing. This is something that actually did happen. And uh, well, that that's where I start to put some of the pieces together that kind of reaffirm the a plausibility. So we've got a plausible stance because we've got building stones of possible evidence that stack up to that then one which would be easy to go through and prove that you know conrad gustafson her adopted dad which he's gone now um was good friends and spent a lot of time with lyndon b johnson lyndon b johnson being the president right right after john f kennedy right uh, and um sure <laughs> Okay. I, I, hopefully I've got my facts right. I might be sounding like an idiot right now. 
But, uh, you know, so we've got kind of that political tie and then there's a kind of odd time frame of her adoption happening within such a close range of that assassination. We know, too, that it is fact that John F. Kennedy really liked his mistresses and ladies. He was a ladies man, right? You know, and and I'm wondering, because none of my family, we're kind of hesitant on whatever we're going to jump into. And honestly, uh, with where a lot of the world's heading, I'm, you know, I already figured if it's a social credit system, I mean, just put me on the outlaw because uh, I, I don't know that my social credit's ever going to be that great. Um, but just where everything's headed, I'm kind of worried about trying to put out a DNA test or get DNA results, you know, but I, I have wondered, you know, what kind of results that might bring back and if that might just sum up some of that solution or if there is indeed fact in that being a blood relative, do I really want that being public or information that can be accessed that way and proven? Does that make sense? So I don't know if yeah. I really want that on record either. If, you know, if those guys are all getting assassinated, <laughs> and we've already dealt with enough to not yeah. be dealing with that. I feel like, you know, so I'm not going to claim that that's true. It's just something that's been thrown out there. Um, but it's something that she believed. Um, I will, will, will say that, but we don't have any further evidence, much more than what I've told you. Um, I will say that we did have a lot of things stolen from us at one point. Uh, when I was six, um, there's a white van parked out in front of our house and like our garage met up to the alleyway in the back. So we all piled up in the back and left out from the driveway. So it was my three siblings, my aunt, my mom, and me all in a little Honda Civic. And um, as soon as my mom seen seen it, I just remember there being a couple of guys in the front of the van. Well, this van, as soon as we jut out from the alley, this van jumps on and it's like on our tail. My aunt's going fast, like 50, 60 miles an hour by this neighborhood. And then she cuts up off the curb. And now she's going across an open field to get over to the main road. Like she's cutting several of the neighborhood streets. And this van's on our tail. And they're they're on our tail until she gets up on the freeway. And within some miles, she finally loses them. And we stayed out of state for a couple of weeks at that point. And um, I think we went up to Oklahoma for a little bit. And when we got back, um, we stayed in a hotel for a couple of nights, maybe with a friend one night. And then my mom was making a deal with the landlord on the other side of town for another house and kind of got resituated, had a few things brought over, but was told that a lot of things were stolen. Maybe there was some paperwork that was stolen. I think there might have been some stuff of hers that was taken. So I don't know if it was something revolving around any of that who they were, but it was really odd thinking back that there'd be somebody purposeful enough to be trying to chase us down, you know? Yeah. So what you're saying is this van chased you guys down, you guys lose the van. mm -hmm. And then when you, I guess, return home or whatever, things were stolen. Uh, Yeah. Well, I never got to step foot back in the house. I was told that a lot of things were destroyed and, um, I was later told that there was, you know, some important things stolen. And I don't know what all they were. I don't know if it could have been evidence or proof, if there was some kind of government deal in it, um, you know, but it kind of raises the bar to the question a little bit higher, like, okay, well, w- what was at stake? What was so important? Or who was this? Or who are we that they'd be <laughs> chasing us? You know, yeah. so, I mean, there's a whole whirlwind of questions and I uh, wouldn't know where to begin to answer some of them. Some of them I might be more satisfied leaving them in the question field than putting myself in a position or finding out that some things are true and then, you know, things transcending into my life and now my family, you know. I uh, don't want that for, for my kids and my family or to get on some path of being chased or feeling like we're being chased and uh, so I would I, would I don't say, know. I would say that um, 
the the idea of you guys, your family, as in you, your wife, kids, uh, I I just get the sense that you're probably out of the radar at this point. Um, just yeah, because I, of what I feel I, like for the most part. Yeah, I mean, because of what I know about you and, you know, some things that we're not going to mention on the show and also, you know, the podcast that came out through a very big company, uh, it, it seemed, like, yeah. I don't think that would have happened if you guys were still on the radar because, th- like, if people have to understand, right. like, this, this stuff goes deep. This stuff goes really deep. And I understand not everybody, like, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. Um, but some of the things that you're saying to me, uh, ring true for my own personal experiences with other people. I mean, uh, I've mentioned it here and there. I'm in communication with somebody who's pretty much known to be dead. And uh, he has a story to share that neither one of us feel comfortable coming out with right now. And th- some of the things you're saying to me in here have a lot of similarities to what he has said to me in the past. Uh, it, it seems almost as if like that that whole robbery situation was almost like they were they they were after you but almost at the same time trying to chase you away so they could do what they wanted to do back at the house. Yeah, that makes sense because uh yeah, realistically if it was, you know, such an event that would be like let's say witness protection worthy which it, a lot of the stuff we went through along with the name changes were very much hinting at a lot of the same things that you would do under witness protection, but I don't know that we were really under witness protection. I do know the FBI was involved. Um, I know we've since been in touch with the, um, with the agent that was involved um, with some of the original stuff with my mom and looking over some of her claims and going to check the supposed uh, burial sites of the, and you probably heard some of that in the podcast if you made it that far. Um, but, uh, you know, so he, he might have a little bit more insight to some of the stuff. I would just probably need to, you know, take time to be able to reach out and maybe have some of those questions ready, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. And then again, you know, some of these people, like, there's only so much that uh, maybe they can share or really talk about, I reckon, you know? Absolutely. I And, you know, earlier you mentioned about how, you know, th- all this stuff, it, it you don't really have a whole lot of proof of it. Uh, and, and that's along your mom's line here. But some of the things... Right. W- one of the things that you, you did mention on the show, and one thing you haven't mentioned yet, I think lend to the idea that it's possible. I'm not saying it, it, it happened this way. I'm not saying anything that's factual. I'm just saying it's possible that it could be a little bit more of a leaning towards proof that this might be something legitimate to look into at least. One is your experience where you feel like you were drugged by that guy. I forget what his name was. Um, and, and I'll get back to him in a second. But also, actually, let me do that now. Um, this guy that and, go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to say, and, and I don't want to put it out there publicly, but between you and me, I'll message you his name. If you want to personally check it out and see it for yourself, but you yeah. might find a little bit intriguing just to see kind of some of his stuff because I might put a little bit into perspective. No, and I mean, it, it, if you, when you see this guy, it looks like the, the cutout uh, cookie cutout from a TV show, of like the kind of well put together, influential, seems like you can trust this guy, uh, you know, tall standing character, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. And what'd you say his specialty yeah, uh, Um, He's a s- spiritual healer slash programmer slash deprogrammer. Um, in fact, um, I- I'm looking it up right now because... I've got his page saved right here. It's, um, I won't say his last name out loud, but let's do a quick security check. That's weird. He says, um, spiritual consultant, D programmer with the sure foundation S U R E. Um, Yeah, it's trying to it's trying to log it on, but yeah, um, I'm not sure. You probably look up some stuff on the Sure Foundation, see some of. Okay, 
Yeah, I'll look into it and stuff. I, I, I just did a quick search on DuckDuckGo and uh, sure, the first several things that pop up is, uh, I guess, some kind of Christian organization, surefoundation.com mm -hmm. dot, or no, dot church. Uh, the first yeah. result was is surefoundation.org, but the title is Sure Foundation Lutheran Church. Uh, so he, he must have some kind of religious affiliation, yeah? Uh, yeah, and he claims to be, but in my experience, um, whatever I witnessed that day was nothing holy or um, spiritually uplifting. If anything, it was downright scary, intimidating, and made me feel completely helpless, you know, so... Um, I, I certainly wouldn't take whatever actions he he committed that day as some uh, result of. I think he hides behind. Right. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> yeah, it's a facade. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it, he, he's got other interests in mind. Right, and and a lot of times people use different things that publicly look good on them just as a cover story <laughs> to what they're really about. Um, and yeah. when, when it comes, and this is something that there, I don't have any, like, I can't say, you know, hundred percent it's happening, but, uh, I personally believe that the, the MK ultra program, uh, I don't think it ever stopped. I just think it changed faces. I think it, it, it changed locations as far as like how you view it and what they call themselves and how mm -hmm. they go about business. And I, I, I wonder if, if he has some kind of tie there, whether he like, I wouldn't say like he's checking in at MK Ultra headquarters, but it, is he being influenced yeah. by by certain people that are affiliated to do certain things with people that you know maybe under direction? And that yeah, you know, part of the question has posed if there is connections between us being chased and and him with that, and I've made some connections to you know was this guy. Did this guy just happen across my mother or was my mother prayed to him? You know, was he seeking out or, you know what I mean? Or was there something before for some reason that he was there other than what we thought? Does that make sense? Because it's a bizarrety of, okay, this guy we met in church and, you know, um, that that would be, you know, that he would have ties to that, you know, and yeah. programming, deprogramming type stuff. Um, so I don't know. No, I, and me neither. Me neither. We're just thinking out loud. And that's what I do on the show. We think out <laughs> loud and connect dots sometimes while we're recording. And sometimes after I'm done recording, I'm like, Oh crap, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night with the, the idea. You're like, Oh my gosh, I get it now. <laughs> but, um, so that happened to you. We hear from you what your mom was at least claiming. Uh, we know what happened mm -hmm. to your family because of your mom. Uh, but the story doesn't end there because your brother John and sister Sarah were in a children's, I guess, group home of some kind. And they had an experience there, at least starting with your sister, that really, like when I heard this, because I did, I, you mentioned you didn't know if I had got to that far. I'd listened to the entire season. I, I, I heard everything that was at least public. Awesome. Um, it, they mentioned on that episode, your sister's experience, and they didn't go down this road. Uh, I don't, you know, quite frankly, I, I, I doubt they would even thought to go down this road. But when I was listening to it, and, and I'm going to have you tell the experience as best you can, uh, it was screaming to me, MK Ultra. I'm driving my truck and I'm like, uh, that's off, that's off, that's off, that's off. Uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, if you could just kind of let the audience know the best, to the best of your knowledge, what happened in that okay. group home. Well, you know, Sarah being five and John being maybe nine, almost 10. John was definitely the protective big brother and then being separated from mom, you know, it was really important for them to be, be by each other. And John woke up one morning and noticed Sarah wasn't there for breakfast. I was like, you know, where, where's Sarah? And, and they're like, Oh, she's sleeping. And then they kind of, I, I remember exactly the details. It seemed like they kind of started roundabout him, but then like, a uh, number of days or maybe a couple of weeks had gone by. He was really worried. Nobody would tell him where Sarah was. 
And then when Sarah came back after being separated for that time, she was completely traumatized and changed. And she was so scared. She couldn't even like just go potty without somebody standing next to her because she was just so fearful of everything. And, um, yeah, John, John said she was never the same after that. And, you know, whatever they did, they basically broke a five-year-old under the protection of the state. And, um, you know, that's, that's part of what we'll be pursuing in this exoneration, I believe is, uh, some of the mistreatments there. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, how deep, you know, what the lawyers might uncover going down this rabbit hole, you know, but, um, as, yeah, as far as she's concerned, um, uh, she, um, I, I can't remember her recollection of it. I mean, there's so much involved with it all that it's hard to recall the exact, um, occurrences, but, um, you know, as far as I can tell, something, something happened to her during that time. What it was exactly isn't really clear, but, you know, she came back a different person and there was a secrecy to each other as to where they'd even been, you know, when they were separated. So that to me, it seems very inhumane and it's, it was a program that was there to protect and help children that were going through something that definitely wasn't a way to handle it, you know? Right. And, and so to kind of tie an outside view into it as well, not an outside view, but you know, third party, I guess, uh, during this time, it, you know, it was, it was during the time of this satanic panic thing. And your family's not the only one that went through this. There's a, there's a lot of families mm-hmm. that went through this and a lot of claims yeah. as to the people doing the investigations to the, the psychologists, uh, kind of almost manipulating the children and forcing them to not forcing them, but manipulating them to the point where they believed that they were, you know, abused in certain ways and they would come forward and say exactly. crazy things. So in order to get a child to do that, I think there's different methods of, of getting there. And it all depends on the character mm-hmm. of the child. And so, yeah, le- leading questions. And, you know, a lot of those interrogators are trained to exploit and direct that conversation, exploit the weaknesses and pick up on the, you know, the kid's body language and then, you know, you for kids, you know, you put out a little reward or this or that, and oh, and then you get this information, you know, or, um, you know, or it could be a question like, and did your dad touch you there? Well, and if you could see me right now, I'm nodding my head as I'm asking that question, like as if you know to direct the child, the, the right answer, and the kid would be like, no. Well, let me ask you this: Did you know? did he maybe do something inappropriate to you here? And, and just ask the same question over and over again to look kids like, well, no is apparently the wrong answer. So I've got to say, yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really ridiculous and almost logically unfounding that you could wrap your brain around that being believability as opposed to just some dirty cop saying, okay, here we go. You know, so maybe I've got a little bit of, <laughs> A little bit of grudge sitting there for for some of them yeah. guys, but well, I mean, because what they'll do is they they establish a foundation uh, to to build off of. So uh, some sometimes kids are easier than others, right? But sometimes they have to really kind of build that foundation to get the desired result that they want. Instead of truth, they're mm-hmm. aiming for something, and so they'll say things like, you know, did your daddy ever give you a bath? Yeah. Did he ever wash you? Yeah. Did he ever touch you there? In the mm-hmm. bath, in the bathtub, yeah. They establish that foundation and they build from there to get the child used to saying yes to certain things, then to get them to say yes to what they want them to say yes to. And I think a lot, a lot of the kids went through those kind of things. Um, it, and I have some, th- I have some theories about that that we'll get into on the other segment here. Um, but uh, Matt with everything that you we've covered here um where is your family now as far as the direction of everything going i, I know your sister and john are like in the, the next room uh at, from where you're speaking right now uh mm-hmm. is the whole family unified in this effort to help exonerate your dad 
from all this stuff or is there is there any kind of there, go ahead no go ahead uh, i was gonna say there's no opposition from the family and the person who would have been most hesitant my aunt um we'll put it this way has told my dad well if you want to save some on the bills i've got an extra room up here you can come move in so obviously her mind and she was the biggest believer in right hand friend to my mom through all of this aftermath you know and she came in the picture just a couple of years after the fact and her coming into the picture i will tell you um she knew overwhelmingly that it was a godsend thing, and she knew literally a year before meeting us that she was going to be meeting somebody, and she would know at that time. So it seemed like in the kind of religious realm of things, the spiritual realm, that there's kind of a precursor set up for her beforehand. But even her being so involved from the, the worst side of it, knowing the most about all the bad stuff about my dad, having met and come to the other side for her to be at the position of, you know, we could be roommates is huge, you know? And it, so that's kind of a pretty good picture of really the, um, the response we've had across the board with, with most of my family and my foster family, you know, I would say my, my brother, Matt, you know, that wasn't confusing at all growing up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've got a foster brother named Matt that, you know, he, he, um, learned about what these girls, um, that did this podcast were doing and got us all in touch and really helped lay the foundation plant the seed for us being able to pursue this story and, and, um, and take this route and all in effort to just, well, we didn't realize how many people had it get to and those girls when I started the story on our family and the podcast didn't realize how big or how far the story would reach and um you know since then uh you know we've we've gotten to talk to a handful of people and more so my bro older brother and sister you know but they've they've talked to other other kids that have gone through some of this stuff There's been some really interesting stories and in fact I believe that the girl that's doing the podcast with my brother, I think had gone through, um, through similar things as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're all, um, I think we're all in support of my dad. We all see kind of the picture and how he was wronged and still to this day. And he, he probably got the sense hearing him on the podcast. You know, I really look up to him in that somehow he doesn't harvest his hate and anger for how he was misdone, you know. He's just happy as all get out to be a, be alive and even happier if he has two cents to rub together, you know. Yeah. Well, I would <laughs> um, say, I mean, your dad had everything taken away from him and with no mm -hmm. promise of ever getting anything back in life. And the fact that he has yeah. three of his kids back in his life, that is worth more than gold. And so I would be the happiest guy in the world. Like if, if you put yourself, you have kids, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, mean, I can see that. Exactly. I mean, imagine being taken from your kids with no promise of ever seeing them again. And then all of a sudden they're back in your life. Like, the, I mean, the, you wouldn't catch me with a bad day, you know? <laughs> Oh, that, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, I forget to think out of my own box uh, a little too often. Um, my life has, has led me around to tendencies of being more pessimistic or just, ah, you know, sailor's mouth on me when I'm by myself, just, you know, getting frustrated over this or that. But, um, yeah, I've come a long way being married. You, you can't act all wild to your man tendencies and stay married, you know, yeah. so I've had a, I've, I've had a little bit of that corrected, you know, since, but, <laughs> um, you, you know, um, the most involved, you know, it doesn't take all of us necessarily working on it, but, um, my foster parents, Wes and Jan, they, they came up in that podcast as well. And, you know, they had a little bit of backstory to kind of tell about my mom and some of their, you know, take on, you know, um, some of their experience in this whole matter of it, because more or less they were there and 
the very beginning with John and Sarah's foster fam family stuff. And they stayed in touch all through the years, you know, willing to keep a helping hand. And when my mom passed, my mom had already set up and knew that we'd have a place to go. So, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, I'm very blessed and fortunate because, you know, I wound up with a really big family after all of it. Um, you know, I've gotten to meet some, some of the cousins and uncle and, and, you know, the grandparents have all passed on by now, but, um, you know, I guess, um, we don't really have any opposition in the family as far as what we're pursuing and why. And, you know, it seems like everybody's kind of pretty much on board and support for it and hoping for the best. So, yeah. And I mean, for people to understand, yeah, your dad's out of jail, but he still has to be registered on the sex offender list. And that, oh, yes, yeah. That that's a huge part of this whole thing of of exoneration. Um, I wanted to oh, ask absolutely. you because you mentioned about how your dad feels and and how he he feels right now and how vibrant he is. How do you, your mm-hmm. sister and brother, feel about your mom right now? Um. Well, I got to kind of sometimes make two boxes for people in your head. I think. <laughs> Um, because there's a part of me that will always love her and honor her as my mother. Um, a lot of it is more of a heartfelt, you know, why or what was going on more kind of questions for her as opposed to, and there was a point, Tony, like even just a couple years ago, kind of after we'd started hashing all this up, you know, I, I would have curse my mother from beyond the grave just you know for what she'd put us through but since then you know kind of learned to not let that anger and harshness abound and you know my feelings and thoughts toward her as much as yeah it's kind of crappy you know and there's no real nice way to say you know she was she was you know kind of a crazy case she had you know all the symptoms and seemed like the schizophrenia to go with it. You know, she claimed to be multiple personality disorder, you know, so all the crazy stuff was there, but, um, you know, I, I still remember the mom though, that, you know, might take us fishing or riding in the, the car with her. And I was always her favorite for some reason, like, you know, so we connected really well. And toward the end when she was in a wheelchair, um, she didn't have a lot of money. You know, we lived off a little bit of government assistance and um, help from churches and lived in a little beat down trailer house uh, in the Dallas area. And we, we'd go for a walk, you know, around to the corner gas station, but we'd go before, you know, John, and Sarah, and the others would get home from school or if it was just me and her, because she didn't want to have to buy everybody something. And she may have done this with all of us, but if she did, she sure made made a way of making me feel special about it, you know. But um, she, you know, take me up there and get a drink and a Butterfinger, and that was kind of our deal. We just walk and talk. And I um, remember singing in the car with her and us duetting. I have fond memories of her, you know, playing the accordion or piano some and singing along with it and Um, so, you know, there's, there's all these great things that, you know, not really knowing better at the age and knowing that she was crazy, didn't really shed a light over me for me to have any hate toward my mother when she was alive. So the way I remember her, I I don't remember ever hating her, but you know, in the after of it all, you know, there's a point where I did kind of question like, uh, man, do I hate my mom? You know, she's been dead for almost 20 years and, and now now it's been crap 22 years yeah yeah 22 years and uh and so there's a box where there's a lot of mystery and a lot of crazy and a lot of like and i can't believe you did this and there's kind of the box like you know and the kind of saving grace is some of her mental illnesses and don't know what to to put in a box of her deliberately lying or you know, her thinking she was telling the truth, you know, and, um, 
So I definitely can't hate her for it because regardless, you know, we watched her uh, work her butt off to try to keep us together and remember her uh, owning her own business at one time. She wasn't in the best health, but she would completely make ready and clean houses from top to bottom. And we'd go help her frequently, you know, I remember scrubbing baseboards at six and seven and we get, you know, I might get paid five, 10 bucks for the day. And I thought that was great. You know, I was happy. So, you know, she had sense to teach us uh, hard work too, you know, and teach us how to earn and, and do some of that from an early age. So, I mean, there's a lot of things about her where she's a really good mother. She's also kind of off in the neighborhood mom. So like a lot of the kids come over to our house and she might have like, okay, well, we're all going to decorate cookies today. Like, okay, cool. You know, everybody likes cookies. So she's always kind of fun stuff for us to do, you know? So I don't know. It's like, she was so crazy on one end and there's so much happening. And she was so, you know, this victim of all these things, and some may be true, maybe not, you know, but on the other end, you know, she was, um, this kind of put in perspective, Tony, um, months before she died, I walk in the house from school and I told you she was paralyzed waist down and on the left side. And she is standing up at the kitchen sink, holding herself up with her right arm and washing the dishes. So she was always like with everything she had, no use of her legs. Like she was standing with her one arm, washing dishes, making sure that kitchen was clean. So, you know, her kids could have a clean home. So she, she definitely always worked hard for us, you know, and even did feats I can look back on and think were dang near impossible, you know? Um, but I've got a lot of respect for her mother. I've got a lot of heartbreak there too. You know, a lot of it's really more sad for her than mad now, if that makes sense. But then again, I also do kind of cling on that. I believe she had faith in Jesus and I believe that she, um, doesn't have to sit here and quarrel with that hell on earth that she went through anymore. And that, you know, that we have a God that's big enough to redeem all of those things, you know? So I I do hope and pray that, you know, she's living a really awesome full life that I can't even imagine now, you know? Um, so I, I don't know, but like, like I said, you know, I kind of keep those two boxes separated in my mind, but the one box with all the negative stuff just isn't as harsh and as angered as it used to be, if that makes sense. You know, I've kind of grown and, and, uh, I've learned, learned more about it and learned to live with it. But upon, you know, a lot of the discoveries we've made in the process of, you know, this conviction story and, and communicating with my dad, you know, a lot of eye-opening stuff, you know, carries a lot of emotional baggage with it and a lot of like, oh, wait, you know. And so, uh, you know, a natural tendency would be to get angry about a lot of those things. But I don't know. I, uh, I've, I've gone through seasons of letting the anger take me as low as, as you can imagine, you know, and by the grace of God, you know, I'm still here, so... I just prefer not to not to let those those kinds of emotions crowd and take my uh, <laughs> you know uh, right take up my being if that makes sense. No, it, yeah. it makes total sense, man. And if your mom if your mom wasn't mentally ill, I could imagine everybody'd feel totally different right now. But the fact is, your mom had her own issues, and uh, mm-hmm. and and that has to play as part of the equation as to how you feel about everything, you know, with hindsight, uh, Mm -hmm. there, there's, there has to be a certain amount of empathy that comes from it. And, uh, and it's nice to hear you say that. And, you know, um, I'll tell you, I, you mentioned about your brother, uh, starting a podcast with that other lady. Um, if your brother ever wanted to come on and talk and stuff, I'd be happy to talk to him about this stuff too. Uh, because it, it's just, it's really interesting to hear your perspective because on, on the other podcast, you weren't featured until the last episode. I don't think they even mentioned your name really. Until right. The last episode. It was just a short tidbit. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is the perspective of a kid who was seven months old when this all first happened. And, uh, your brother was nine. 
And so he has a completely different perspective. Uh, but it's it's really it's really nice to hear how you feel uh, with hindsight. And uh, man, listen, I think we're gonna um, we're gonna head into the overtime segment right now. But I wanted to let the okay. I wanted to let the listeners know right now that there is a GoFundMe to help your dad. And there's there's a lot of financial things of traveling, staying in hotels, eating when you're out of town and stuff. And just like your mom, your dad lives on, what, what would you say it was just a, a like a paycheck a month from uh, Social Security? Uh, you know, I think like 700 or something dollars, you know, he pays his rent and he makes a hundred dollars stretch for his food. And uh, he, he lives in a place where basically his bathtub is falling through the pier and beam floor. And you know, being a registered sex offender too limits him so much. So he basically lives in a slumlord place that's made for, you know, kept around for, you know, basically for lack of a better word, like rejects or people that, you know, other people don't want around in their neighborhood or society, you know? And so it's, you know, uh, to me, it's almost, it's almost kind of a little slap of shame that he has to live that way to me. You know, I wish, wish, uh, kind of wish the siblings were better equipped to <laughs> come back and take care of them already. Well, but, uh, I think you guys are just not there. No. Well, no, I think you are there, man. I really do. I think what you guys are doing is, is in the process of helping your dad, whether it's the legal part of it and helping him get through that to, uh, exposing the story on a, on a mass scale. So people hear about it and they're more inclined to reach out and help in any way they can. I, I think you guys are doing it now. And I, I think it's really good, man. I really do. Uh, it, it would be easy for you guys to just reconnect with dad and, you know, sail off into the sunset and just kind of let things fall where they may. But you all have a sense of justification. There needs to be justification here. And I, I respect that yeah. a lot. Uh, if, if anybody in the audience wants to help, they can go to the GoFundMe. I'll put it in the uh, link in the description of this show. Uh, and the title of the GoFundMe, I don't know much about GoFundMe, but I can tell you, uh, I don't know if you can search for this title, but it's called Exonerating Melvin Quin- Quinney, Victim Satanic Panic. And uh, and so if anybody wanted to go and, and help contribute to that uh, GoFundMe, they can do that right there. It's open and available to you if you feel inclined to do so. Uh, but Matt, man, Listen, stick around with me. We're going to go into overtime and we're going to get into some more paranormal experiences that you and your family have gone through. And uh, we're going to we're going to touch on the MK Ultra stuff again and maybe scratch it a little bit harder uh, in the overtime segment. Okay. But uh, uh, just to give the audience a, a heads up as to what's coming here, uh, we're going to talk about anything from miracles to what it sounded like to me in the email as uh, some kind of teleportation or not teleportation. Maybe I'll just say call it a transport of some kind. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, sister, your sister's astral projection, um, prophetic dreams involving 9-11. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're going <laughs> to we're going to dive into here. And uh, hopefully people you know stick around and check it out. But Matt, thanks for being here on this first segment, man. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. That's the best thing you can do to help this show grow is to share it around the internet with your friends, not just the internet. Text it to people. I don't care how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it. And just a reminder, we are doing an overtime segment available right now on the website in the overtime segment section for the members. So if you want to hear more of this conversation, head on over there if you're a member and check it out. And also in the description of this episode is the GoFundMe for members. Matt and his family. So if you feel inclined to help this family fight back and get dad exonerated, go ahead and click that GoFundMe link and go ahead and contribute anything that you feel led to do. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. The, uh, I turned onto the road, um, which led up to my customer's house. And I was maybe a quarter mile from my last turn, I believe. And I got a phone call, and it was one of the supply companies. It might have been like a Home Depot, just confirming like an order. So it was kind of an inconsequential, just like seven or eight second literal phone calls. Like, okay, cool, I'll be there, so-and-so. Uh, maybe a 10, 15 second phone call, but 
I um, had my GPS on because going all between the places, it definitely helped to have a, a guiding map uh, handy, even though I pretty much knew the area, but um, some parts were kind of new to me. And um, I looked at my phone, which was on my little dash holder for it, and I clicked the red button to end the call. And as soon as I looked up, the whole scenery, and you, you got to think for me to look down at my phone pushing up. Um, I mean, I've still got the road in my peripheral, but somewhere in my crossing and looking up, the whole view around me was completely different, was completely changed. And, um, and I, I was very disoriented, like, um, they, you know, this doesn't seem right. How did I get on this wrong road? And I drive maybe a quarter mile. I'm like, okay, I would have seen the customer's house. And um, and I uh, pull over because my maps was frozen up. And my maps was frozen on the spot. And I looked back at it and I was able to zoom in. And it showed me where I thought I was at right before my customer's turn. But I knew that this area was not right, but the maps was frozen. I had to restart my phone, turn the you know phone back on. It updated, and also in that time there was there's no passive time. You know, it's like a few second phone call, and I literally looked down for two seconds and was in a completely different area. The um, and just to confirm, when my phone came back on, I looked back at the um, the phone call and the time that it took place. And at this point, um, you know, I'd already pulled, drove, drove some, pulled over, gone through, staring at my map deal, and then my it being frozen, um, turning my phone back off, turning it back on. So it'd been like five or six minutes since that phone call. My maps updated, and it showed me like nine miles away from that location, but it was on a completely different road too. Thousands of government-sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. Informed consent means your doctor tells you the risk of the treatment you are about to undergo. In too many cases, informed consent was withheld. Americans were kept in the dark about the effects of what was being done to them. The deception extended beyond the test subjects themselves to encompass their families and the American people as a whole for these experiments were kept secret. And they were shrouded not for a compelling reason of national security, but for the simple fear of embarrassment. And that was wrong. The United States of America offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, to their families, and to their communities. When the government does wrong, we have a moral responsibility to admit it. The duty we owe to one another to tell the truth and to protect our fellow citizens from excesses like these is one we can never walk away from. Our government failed in that duty. This report I received today is a monumental document, but it is a very, very important piece of America's history, and it will shape America's future in ways that will make us a more honorable, more successful, and more ethical country. I think it must be engraved on our national memory.